Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church in Sullivan, Illinois. My name is Pastor Grant. I want to thank you for joining us on this Memorial Day weekend. That video was a great reminder for us of how important it is to remember those who have sacrificed everything for our freedom. As we begin our time of worship today, a couple of announcements to share with you. First, uh, just a continued reminder that an important part of being a church family is holding one another in prayer. Uh, due to privacy concerns, I'm not sharing prayer requests during our live streaming videos, uh, but if you have requests that you would like to share or things that you would like prayer for, you are welcome to share those with us during our live stream on Facebook, or you can send them directly to me at any time. One final thing, if you are struggling during this time and need financial assistance or prayer, please reach out to me so that we can help get you through. Now let's begin our time of worship with prayer. Gracious God, we pray for your blessing on this church in this online space. We come to you this day to learn of your will for our lives, heal our wounds, lift our spirits, give us courage and confidence to boldly serve you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now you are invited to follow along with our call to worship and then join together in singing a hymn of praise.
Please join me in prayer. God of love, we live in a world that feels increasingly divided. Remind us today that we are all your creation, created in your image. Place your healing hand upon us and assure us of your love and care. There are so many things that weigh heavenly on our hearts right now. So we give these things to you, trusting that you will help us carry our burdens. We remember today those who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom to live and worship as we please. We also remember those who continue to put their lives on the line each day. Military, healthcare workers, law enforcement officials, so many. We do not take their sacrifices for granted. Hear our prayers today, Lord, for those who are facing difficult circumstances, whether that be financially, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We place our lives and our trust in you, our creator, sustainer, and redeemer. Amen. Let us now remember the prayer Jesus taught as a model of prayer for our own lives. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever. And forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 1. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And then from Genesis chapter 28, And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. The question I want us to wrestle with this morning is, it's very simple to pose, but surprisingly difficult to answer. And the question is this, Where is Jesus? In a moment of casting around for an opening illustration to this sermon, I wondered if there were any Where's Jesus posters in the style of Where's Waldo? Maybe you remember those cartoon-style books. Well, a moment or two on Google led to a quick answer. Yes, there are indeed many, many Where's Jesus posters, but two in particular struck me. The first makes me smile every time I've seen it. It's just a cartoon. Uh, You should be able to see it right here on the screen now. It's two door-to-door evangelists speaking to a woman and asking her, have you found Jesus? And now if you look closely at this, at this image, you can just see Jesus hiding right behind the curtain. Do you see him there? Well, Francis of Assisi, in his search for Jesus, famously discovered that Jesus was to be seen in the face of the poor, the suffering, and the outcast. You can see this Where's Waldo depiction of Jesus capturing that idea. Where's Jesus? Seriously. Where the hell is he? People are starving. And this seemed to me to be a very good question. Where is Jesus when people are starving? Where's Jesus when a pandemic strikes? Where's Jesus when people suffer and die in war and conflict? Where's Jesus when people sit at borders, hoping against hope for a new life? This is almost the same question is one of the basic questions of Christianity, which asks, why God, a God of love allows suffering in the world? But it isn't quite the same question, and in some ways it may be more helpful. 
the question, why does God allow suffering, is abstract. But the question, where is Jesus when suffering happens, it's far more concrete and answerable. We might wonder, why does the book of Acts so clearly depict him ascending into heaven? From the perspective of Jesus' disciples, those who had known him in the flesh, as it were, who had wandered the streets and byways of Palestine with him, sharing food and laughter and seeing people transformed by his physical touch, it certainly seemed as if Jesus had gone from their midst. The story of the ascension captures eloquently the sense of isolation felt by these early followers who no longer had available to them in the person of Jesus to consult with and engage with in ways both trivial and meaningful. He had gone from them. Of course, the isolation had begun at the cross, that moment of absolute departure as the earthly Jesus was nailed to a tree and hung until he was dead, with the earthly life of the Savior coming to an end at that point. But then there was the strange interlude of the resurrection, as people discovered that in some way, Jesus was still present with and within them, able to continue affecting their lives. And then we come to this strange story of the ascension, which marks the transition from encountering Jesus as a man to encountering him by the ongoing presence of his spirit. And so Luke tells us that Jesus has ascended into heaven. But the problem with this is that it can be very hard to know quite what we mean when we say that Jesus is in heaven. What does that mean to assert that Jesus has gone from the earth, but is still alive and present with God? These are deep mysteries, and there are no straightforward answers. In fact, before we can even begin to answer what it means to say that Jesus is in heaven, we need to have some idea of what we mean by heaven in the first place. Where is heaven, for heaven's sake? Is it above the stars? Is it in a galaxy a long time ago and far, far away? Is it a place on earth, as Belinda Carlisle once sang? Would we be better, as John Lennon, John Lennon famously challenged us, imagining that there's no heaven and above us only sky? Certainly, in our modern scientific post-enlightenment worldview, it becomes very hard to sustain the notion that heaven is in some way up there. We don't have a cosmology that thinks heaven is up and hell is below because we know that the fires that erupt from below are a function of the movement of the earth's tectonic plates and not the breaking through of the fires of eternal torment. Similarly, we know that the sky above us is populated by stars and galaxies held in place by gravitational forces rather than by spirits of bright light that might be angels or even gods looking down on us from on high. So what are we to make of a passage like today's reading from Acts, where we are told quite clearly that Jesus recently returned from his journey to the hellish depths of the earth is now lifted up on a cloud into heaven? What are we to make of the promise that he will return in the same way that he went? And if we think for a moment of our Old Testament reading from Genesis, what are we to make of Jacob's vision of a ladder stretching from earth to the heavens with angels ascending and descending upon it? Well, firstly, perhaps I ought to clarify what I think we should not make of it. Uh, this is not an invitation for self-proclaimed Bible-believing Christians to rewrite their science textbooks in favor of a first-century understanding of the cosmos. More than the creation and flood narratives from earlier in Genesis are an invitation for us to reject the insights of science regarding the age of the earth and the origin of species. So was there actually a ladder from heaven to earth? No, I don't think there was. It was a vision, a dream that revealed something of profound truth to Jacob. But it was never a, it was never a historical reality. And I suggest a similar approach to the story of Jesus' ascension. Did he historically ascend on a cloud at the end of his earthly life? I suspect maybe not. And I think to try to make it so misses the point. This is not a story about what happened to Jesus' body. It's a story about heaven and earth. So to return to the question of where 
or what is heaven? If it is not literally up there, then where is it? Well, I like how Tom Wright describes heaven. He says it's, it's God's space, a bit like an extra dimension to the world as we normally encounter it. It is the world as it should be, the world as it might be, the world as it sometimes can be, and maybe, just maybe, it is the world as it one day will be. We catch glimpses of God's space all the time if we teach our eyes and minds to pay sufficient attention. From the beauty of a sunset over the sea, to the miracle of a baby's first cry, to the selfless act of generosity and kindness, to the touching places of baptism and communion. There are moments in life when the boundary between here and there becomes transparent enough to let the glory and peace and joy of God's space break into the complex and conflicted world of this present darkness. In fact, we pray these moments into being every time that we speak the words of the Lord's Prayer, as we did earlier. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We speak aloud our longing for and commitment to the idea of God's space invading our space in ways that transform and redeem the present despair into hope, loss into comfort, and sin into salvation. You see, as Christians, we don't believe in heaven up there, or indeed hell down there. Rather, we believe that there is a new world coming, and that it is breaking in upon this world. It is in the light of this conviction that we need to hear the story of the ascension, if we are not going to miss the true point of the story. The ascension of Jesus is ultimately the ultimate touching place of heaven and earth. That which Jacob saw in a dream becomes fully realized in the person of Jesus, in whom the boundary between our space and God's space is transcended. You see, in Jesus, the God of heaven becomes present to us, just as we are brought near to the one who would otherwise be absent from us. In the life and ministry of the earthly Jesus, we encounter God with us, walking and talking and laughing and crying and living and dying with us. In the resurrection of Jesus, we encounter God defeating the power of death and releasing us from the tyranny of the grave that otherwise haunts our waking moments and keeps us from being most fully alive. In the ascension of Jesus, we encounter God eternally embracing humanity in all our fallenness and brokenness, as the Messiah, still bearing in his body the marks of the crucifixion, embraced by heaven. The earthly Jesus is the resurrected Jesus, is the ascended Jesus. In Jesus, earth and heaven meet. Here's the thing I'm trying to say. Heaven is not about where we go at the end of this life. And it was not where Jesus went at the end of his life. Rather, heaven is the alternate reality that breaks into this life. And it is Jesus who brings the two realities together as God's space and our space collide. The ascension isn't about where Jesus has gone. Rather, it is about how Jesus opens the doorway to God's space in the midst of human time and history. The ascension is about the true and lasting value of being human. You see, this life is not a stage we are passing through on our way to somewhere else. Rather, it is the reality within which salvation is found and redemption received through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so those who follow Jesus through his life, death, and resurrection become those who are sent to the whole earth, commissioned by the Spirit to bring all the good news of reconciliation between heaven and earth. We are those who learn to say with Jacob, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. We are those who learn to see the possibilities of heaven in our midst, in the midst of the ordinary. We are those who learn to proclaim the alternate reality of God's space and to live that reality into being in our lives and in our world.
Heaven is not where we go to escape this life. It is this life redeemed. The ascension of Jesus challenges us to see differently and having seen to live differently. If God's space is coming to our space, then we have our own part to play in seeing that kingdom come. This has to make a difference to the way we live. It has to affect our discipleship. It has to affect and challenge our relationship to our possessions. It has to challenge our relationship to our neighbors. It has to challenge the decisions we make and the ideologies we live by. Because if it doesn't, then we deny in our lives the miracle of the ascension. And we tear heaven from the earth and consign God's space to somewhere else. May you see the reality of heaven in our midst as God is breaking through, as our world is being transformed. May your life be renewed. May you rise up to meet the challenge that Jesus pre presents to us. Let's pray. God, it seems as though each day brings its own challenges to us. This world is not an easy place for us to live, especially now. So help us to see that you are still at work. You are working in ways we don't always realize. Help us to grab hold of this reality of your kingdom come here on this earth. Help us to trust that you are in control that you are at work, working all things together for good. We trust that that is what is true. We trust that you are a God who is faithful. We see that faithfulness from generation to generation. We proclaim it today in Jesus' name. Amen. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, and in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, our talents, and our material possessions. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and what, in our, in what is ours to give as a blessing to this world. Thank you for displaying God's generosity through your continued support of the work and ministry of First Christian Church. You're welcome to continue giving by mail or online through our website. May you continue to see God's blessings in your life as you bless others through your gifts. As we transition to our time of communion, I invite you to take a moment and prepare elements if you have not already done so. Whatever you have works. It doesn't have to be bread and grape juice. Even as Jesus called his disciples one by one by name, so the risen Christ calls each of us one by one by name to come and share about this table in a community of love. Join him not because you are good, but because Christ accepts you. Eat and drink with Christ within the universal fellowship of those who are loved without reservation, just as they are. Please join me in singing another hymn. During this song, you are welcome to partake of the elements as you so choose. Ah! Uh -huh.
Being washed in the love of Christ, now go into this world with the healing love of God to be given generously in peace and hope. God's peace will always be with those who live in God's love. May you be blessed as you demonstrate the beauty of God's love this week. When peace like a So